Pop quiz time. What's the state capital of Washington? It's Olympia. And that's where I am this morning. Friday morning. And I'm just going to step right across the street from the state capitol building and visit the Washington Geological Survey and one of the most talented people around, Daniel Coe. Thanks for joining us today. Hope you enjoy this very special episode. Yes, and we, we just reopened to the public a few months ago. I want to say post-pandemic, but um, uh -huh. yeah down curve anyway okay <clears throat> well this is a rare treat i've never been in here so thanks <laughs> thank you for special. visiting <laughs> and for rookies this this moniker washington geological survey hasn't been around forever it was formerly known as what we've had about i think five or six different names since the late 1800s which is when the original survey was founded okay um <laughs> previous to the washington geological survey we were the department of geology and earth resources or deger for short DGER. and our state geologist at the time dave norman has been he had been wanting to change our name to the washington geological survey just because it's more straightforward oh, to the I point i love it i so. love it yes so that change was maybe a decade ago or more recent? Oh, more recent. That? I feel like it was about five years ago. Okay. Yeah. Uh, these are our offices. Welcome. Thank you. So the Washington Geological Survey is a division within the Department of Natural Resources. So there's, I, I think, about a dozen different divisions. So we are one part of that, and we've got, I think, almost 50 employees now, so. 50? Yeah, we've, we've gotten several new people in the past year or so, so. Well, it does seem like a lively scene, just, just as an innocent bystander, like compared to 20 years ago, I don't really know, but it feels like there's, there's a lot of momentum going on. In the there is, there is, yeah. There's a lot of um, new funding from, you know, the USGS for geologic mapping and earth mm -hmm. resources and things like that, so. Um, Hello. Yeah, yeah, it's a good time to good time to be a geologist, I think. <laughs> <laughs> so here's one of our new our new lidar images, Drumheller channels. Are you kidding me? Nope. We we've, we've gotten some new lidar data on the east side of Washington and it's it's incredibly detailed. Oh my it's god. Really well, I know you're a modest guy, so you're going to saying we and our a lot, but it's all you, right? <laughs> no, a lot of no, this no, lidar no. stuff is you. Nope, I didn't. I didn't. I didn't fly the plane. I didn't collect the data. I didn't clean it up, process it. We've it's a long chain of people working on this before it gets to me. Well, well this is going to be a challenge. I can already tell. I'll get you to <laughs> toot your own horn, but I'll, I'll figure out a way. Like, I know we're heading to some. stuff. Yeah, oh. yeah. No, we've got lots of. Lots this of is you. Come on, you can, you're not sharing the. This is the Sauk River, yeah. This yeah. is a relative elevation model of the Sauk River in the North Cascades. Wow, so when I visualize people walking at, working at the Washington Geological Survey, I'm visualizing this space? Yep. Is this, this is this kind is of the whole entity This is where it, it happens. Okay. Well, you can tell I want to be distracted here, but let's, let's <laughs> yeah, let's. Sure. You've got some stuff laid out, and I, early in the video here, I'd like to so yeah, these are all our Washington 100 posters kind of laid out, which we can talk more about that. Yes. Yeah, I, right, let's just, let's just do a little Whitman sampler here <laughs> to get a sense of, of why I'm here, but I think many of our viewers have already figured it out. Hey, hey how hello. are you? How are you? I'm doing well, you? Good, good. I'm Nick. I know. <laughs> <laughs> this is Jessica Sikowski. She's our oh, assistant. Jessica, assistant I'm sorry, state yes. Geologist. I remember meeting you a couple times yeah. in the past. Yeah. yeah. Well. What are you doing here? I'm here to uh, make a little video about this young man. Oh. I'm just so impressed with what he does, and I wanted to learn more. Awesome. Yeah. Good. Hey. Hi, this uh, is Casey Hinnell, Casey State Hinnell. Geologist. Hi, Casey. I'm Hi. Nick. Nice to meet nice you. Nice to meet you. Yeah. Um, Love your work. Well, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Well, I just, I just am so excited to be here, and I'm very impressed with what you guys are doing. So, wonderful. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> okay. Well, can we start here, Dan? Because sure. this is, I, I saw 
I assume it was some sort of kind of premiere or some sort of push to share this recently, it feels like, right? Yeah, so May in Washington is Washington or is Volcano Awareness Month. Okay. So just kind of bringing people's awareness to the, the hazards that volcanoes do pose mm -hmm. in our region or can have the potential to. Um, and this is a map I've had in my head for a long time that I've been working on for a little while, Mount St. Helens, um, kind of a bird's eye view of the north side of the volcano. And I wanted to highlight some oh. some ways the volcano and the sur its surroundings have changed in the past 40 years, you know, 40 or so years since the eruption. So um, got some features like the, the crater glacier, which has been growing, the two large lava domes in the crater, um, kind of discuss the North Fork of the Tootle River and all the issues with sediment that are happening there. Spirit Lake, how that's changed over time. And then also the Pumice Plain, which is kind of right in here. Wow. So I'm already gonna violate my plan. My plan was to just get a sampler, but I, I can't, I can't uh, with <laughs> stop asking questions right off the bat. So I'm intrigued by your phrase, I've had this in my head. So this, this perspective you had in your head and why did you have, uh, can you tell us more about what you had in your head and why you thought that wasn't maybe presented before? Yeah, so I, not only am, am I a map maker, I'm also a map consumer. And I've never, I haven't seen a map of Mount St. Helens like this before. And I've wanted one just for my own personal <laughs> use. So I finally decided to just right. make it myself since right. I couldn't find it. Yes. Um, you know, there's a lot of great maps of Mount St. Helens, uh, St. Helens out there, um, for sure, by the USGS and the Forest Service and yep. plenty of other entities. But yep. none that I found that's kind of like this. You know, you're flying over the volcano. Here's what. Here's the lay of the land and the right. landforms. So. Right. Right. Well, that's, so that's hoping to get them out there into the world for people. Outstanding. I'm going to run out of superlatives. I know today. <laughs> um, Okay, I'm back to my original plan, just trying to give a quick overview, and then I have some rather significant personal questions for you. You know, driving, driving over here, I was trying to remember which, which of these caught my eye first, you know? Like, I, I, I definitely remember, like, who is this guy making this stuff? Like, I've never seen anything like this before. Got some stuff hiding under here too. Oh really? Okay, yeah. Let's let's keep it. What, what you got? Mm-hmm. So, well, I'm such a fan. I recognize all these. This was one of the first posters we did when I started here at the survey. Okay. Um, I had w I previously I worked in the Oregon Oregon Department of Geology as well mm -hmm. with lidar and things like this. So, okay. Um, when I got here, one of our hazards geologists asked me to to make a poster of the Chehalis River because there were a lot of projects surrounding that at the time. So um, yeah, so I got to do that. And I also made a river river poster of the outer Olympic coast as well. So these are five of the big rivers out there kind of showing their channel migration over time. And this was all made with LIDAR data. As a fan of your Instagram page and <laughs> other kind of media channels, I think of this look for you more than anything. Is it fair to say that's one of your hallmarks of what you do? You're continuing to do these river type. Yeah, I love to, I love to work with LiDAR data and rivers I feel like are the most elegant uh, visualization of that yeah. data often. Yeah. Um, and as time goes on, the more and more publicly available data there is uh, you know, all over the world, not just here in the Pacific mm -hmm. Northwest. So um, it's great to experiment with, with rivers in other areas. And I like to do that in my free time as well. <laughs> you have been doing that. I've been noticing. Yeah, you're, yep. you're, you can just get a data set, uh, a LIDAR data set from X river in some place on some continent, and then you can kind of do your magic. Yep, yep. Well, um, as a rookie, why was that not possible before? What you need lidar to create these path channels? So, if you were just looking, if you were just flying over this area, for mm -hmm. example, you know, Western Washington in particular, we've got tons of trees, right? We've got yes. tons of conifers that 
big forests that cover the landscape. So most of these areas are covered by trees mm -hmm. and you, you can't really see. You can see the active channel of the river, but the areas that have had channels in the past where trees have grown up over time, you can't see it. Mm -hmm. So with um, airborne LIDAR data, basically they, f they fly a plane over, shoot a bunch of laser points at the ground, and those lasers kind of reflect off of the surface of trees and the ground and go back up to a sensor in the plane. Um, and then once that data is all collected, you can take just the points that hit the ground and kind of extract those. And that's what allows us to see just the, the surface of the earth like this. So you can basically strip away all the trees digitally and structures and buildings and things like that. So um, it allows you to, to see a lot. Um, and it's great for geologists and geomorphologists because you know, it's like putting on glasses, you know, all the yeah. trees are gone, all the structures are gone, and right. you're just looking at the ground. So right. you can see, you can see tons of stuff, landslides, faults, um, river channels, things like that. And, you know, part of me wants to think three-dimensionally with these, like these older channels are, are deeper, but you're saying that's not true. This is all the surface, and we're just seeing where this live snake has been slithering. He kind of, yeah, in okay. this, in this case, the, um, these have been converted from a digital elevation model to a relative elevation model. And okay. basically what that means is the zero value in a digital elevation model would be sea level. Okay. And then everything would go up from there. Uh -huh. And in these ones, the zero value is that, that water surface of the river. So if you think of it this way, the white is the lowest elevation in these. And as it goes up, it gets darker green. Oh. So the darker it is, the higher above the river it is. So as you go out from it, it'll usually fade into the darkest color. That's helpful. I didn't. I was thinking about it almost inversely from that. That's but a, a lot of them do have a, a kind of a three-dimensional effect to them, especially if you weren't familiar with what you were looking at. Yes. And speaking of three dimensions, I mean that's what strikes me here from the Bellingham area. Same idea. There's no way to see this walking around in the arboretum above Western or whatever, <laughs> right? I mean, it's just too many trees. Is it the same general process? You get the LIDAR and you then, actually this is the part that I'm curious about. So anybody can see the LIDAR. So you're, is there a way for you to give us a sense of how you take raw LIDAR and then a couple of two, three steps, five steps to then ramp up to the presentation that you have here. Yeah, so there's a few different techniques you can use. This is this is actually pretty different than that um, okay. in that this has what we call shaded relief or a hill shade. So we take those elevation values and we can, we can kind of put an artificial light source on it so it's shining on the surface. So if you think of this, the light's coming from the northwest and it's shining on this three-dimensional surface. So that gives it that 3D kind of relief that you're seeing here. So in this case, you know, if you lower that light down, you could really make those features pop out. Um, and in this case, it's, you know, all the layers of the, the Chuckanut Formation in north, northwestern Washington. So, and this area is kind of cool because there's tons of really neat fossils up there, you know, big palm leaves, the, well, this, you know, yay big, <laughs> <laughs> that are just all over the place. Um, tons of plant fossils, even a few animal, you know, footprints and things of that nature, so. Um, there's there's aspect, you know, you can colorize things depending on what angle it's facing. Yeah. Um, so there's all sorts of different ways of visualizing this sort of data, but um, probably the two I use the most are just assigning color values to elevations and using kind of these light sources to, to make the landscape pop. Did you have something in mind originally for each of these, like you had kind of an image in your head for the St. Helens poster? Um, more or less. I mean, a lot of these kind of change the more you, you get into the weeds of making them. You know, you might find a technique that works better yeah. or something that you thought would work that doesn't really work very well. Right. Um, so there's a lot of trial and error that go into these for sure. Um, well, here's, here's another great example of why I'm such a fan. You know, th it feels like if you're trying to convey a geologic story, it's a place everybody knows. Uh, if they do know it, and they do know there was a landslide, we're upstream from Portland now, so the Oregon side. People are whizzing by it back and forth on the freeway. There's not one classic place to stop and see this. Mm -hmm. 
and then again your color choice and everything else it just makes all this stuff pop so much dan i like i don't know if you have a good <laughs> sense that you are filling a niche that most of us who are trying to teach this stuff just cannot quite do i mean we spend 20 minutes with words and this thing is all that we would really need i don't know i mean it's it's like with any other profession you just try to learn as you go and mm -hmm. learn from your peers um I, I try to go to a conference called NASIS. It's the North American Cartographic Information Society. And, and usually the people that go to that are some of the best map makers on the planet, quite frankly. <laughs> um, and it's nice to rub shoulders with them and learn from each other and hmm. kind of show different techniques and mm -hmm. what you're doing. So that's always a great opportunity to learn from others in the field. Um, but yeah, I've always liked bright colors and yes, color can definitely bring something to the foreground or push it to the background, just depending on how you use it. So, um, Oh my God, look at that. It's always something I try to work into the maps and graphics that I made. I mean, it feels like you're doing, it doesn't feel like anybody else is doing what you're doing. I don't know. I, I don't know if I'd say that, but <laughs> Like, um, well, in the Northwest, I mean. There's plenty of other great Northwest cartographers, um, mm. for sure, doing doing really interesting stuff. So, uh, um, Well, I'm fawning over you now, so we, we <laughs> don't want that. I can feel I need to pull it back a little <laughs> bit. Um, some of our viewers do know this series. Oh, you got more? Oh, I, got, I got one more. In Good. There, or maybe, yeah. This is just Mount Olympus. Another favorite. Um, I love the Olympic peninsula the olympic mountains so living in olympia is great because we're right at the doorstep of some of the best landscapes in the northwest so do i go to the Flickr page is that the easiest yeah, this, way that's to probably the this? easiest way to download the full size okay. digital version um you know you can always email me for example if you didn't want all this text and stuff on top mm -hmm. i i still have the files for the background if you mm. wanted to kind of add your own annotation and i'm glad you brought that up because yeah. This this poster we actually also released without any of the, the oh, text and really? stuff on top, oh. so you can take it and add your own oh. labels and notes and whatever you want to to it. So, highly encourage anyone that wants to use it to do so. Um, and you can use this for any any purpose um, as long as you cite you know us as the the sure. source. Now this is or is not lidar. It is LiDAR, it yes, is and LIDAR. it's several different data sets were used to, to create this. Um, a fairly recent one for the glacier, just because that's grown oh, a lot right. in the past decade or so. Um, it's just stunning so, yeah. work. Do you? Thank you. Well, yes. Well, we've well, got, yeah. if you need any Washington <laughs> geology maps, you take, got a, a, few, take huh? a stack. Oh my God. We've actually got the author of this map sitting right over here. Oh, really? Eric? Yep. Form. Got it. So this is Eric Schuster. He made that map several years ago, Eric. Hi, Eric. Eric's been Good with morning. the survey nice over, you. over 50 years, I think, at this point. Yeah, I'm in my 52nd year, yeah. 52nd year. Just can't leave. <laughs> and you've worn lots of hats over those years. Yeah, including this one. <laughs> <laughs> and Eric's actually updating, or not updating, but digitizing. What I'm doing right now is digitizing the uh, USGS publication by um, uh, Rocky Crandall. Oh uh, wow! Rainier National Park. Really? I'm, I'm. If I live long enough, I'll finish all of the intermediate scale, uh, pre-digital geologic maps. In other words, they exist only on paper. Right, right. So I rectify them and and uh, turn them into a GIS product. Wow. That eventually will end up on our website and be downloadable by anybody who wants it. That will be wonderful. Like the other scales are now. Yes. Always something to look forward to. That's not definitely something to look forward to. Yeah. Well, thank you. It's a pleasure to meet you. Yeah, you're quite welcome. Yeah. <laughs> So this is back where I live. Fire up the computer. Okay, now, so, yes. Geologic maps, so I'm actually in the process. Um, our mappers, you know, they, they spend the whole year 
this is started kind of the start of field season where they head out and mm -hmm. um, are mapping in the field and then they come back for the winter and bring everything into the GIS realm. And then around this time of year, you know, all the data and the, 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 the writing and everything about it comes to our group. And I'm part of the GIS and publications team here. Okay. So we put out all the publications, the website, all of our data portals, we manage all that stuff. So, you know, as, as a, the graphics editor and kind of the, the main cartographer, I get to stylize these and lay them out and try to make them look good and make sense. Um, and then our, our editors are the ones working on the pamphlets and I see. the text and everything like that. So, so there's a decided effort to, to, to have a, a visual component that works together through a whole series of maps? Um, yes assume. and no. I mean, you can see there's actually three maps working on this year. So this is kind of in the, the Cascades here. And then um, this is in Thurston and Pierce County. So this is more surficial deposits mm -hmm. and things like that. So you can see the color schemes are quite different. Yeah. And then um, this is actually over in your neck of the woods. This is um, uh, the Clockham Pass Southeast Quad. So I think just to the east of Ellensburg. Well, you do like um, bright colors, don't I you? I do, yeah. This, the, <laughs> and and often, you know, I'll, our mappers are just kind of moving over as they, they map from year to year to different quads. So this is kind of part of a series over the last three or four years yes. that Andrew, this is actually Andrew right. Sadowski's map. So um, so you'll carry his I'm colors kind of carrying, through. yeah, carrying those themes throughout. Yeah. So yeah. the other the other fun thing about these is, you know, everything's got to be labeled clearly and well. And you can see there is a lot of labeling to do. <laughs> so, you know, you can you can generate these labels digitally really quickly, but you know, often they're overlapping or on top of one another, or you've got lines crossing over. So right, right. you know, pretty much I've touched every single one of these labels and moved it around <laughs> at, at a you know, one point in time or another. So there's a lot of time spent just in laying things out and getting them to be legible and understandable. Okay, I'm writing your own narrative now. Not appropriate, probably, <laughs> but I'm guessing like, okay, we're going to hire this guy and we're going to hire him to do this. And then in addition to that, you start doing this more creative stuff and they go, oh, this guy, oh, <laughs> is that kind of so, what happened? So kind of, my, so my, my predecessor retired about six years ago okay. and that's how this position became open. Mm -hmm. And I had been working at the Oregon Department of Geology and Mineral Industries um, kind of as a GIS um, technician or analyst. And over my years there, I kind of, that, that's kind of what happened there. I started working more on the state map projects um, which is a USGS funded geologic mapping program. And then, you know, we had a lot of LIDAR data in Oregon as well. So I started doing, um, we started doing a LIDAR calendar every year where I could make 12 mm. cool images for the year of different features in the state. So that's kind of what started me off on that LIDAR path. And then this yeah. position became open. It was more a more permanent um, sort of position. So it it fit, it fit well. And they, they were looking for someone who had experience with the state map. Yes and things like that. So, so yeah, pretty close to what you, you were describing. <laughs> well, it's a credit to an organization to hire you. You do what you were hired to do, and then you kind of have these, cr for lack of a better term, creative ideas and directions you want to go, and they don't shut you down. They don't go, no, 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 no. Yeah, stay, can, 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 Zip it. But yeah. Get back to that. <laughs> as long as these things get done on yeah, time, and, right. you know, there's a little extra time here and there to right. work on, you know, those sorts of creative projects. I definitely, I feel fortunate to work with a lot of talented people for one thing. But mm -hmm. but yeah, um, to al to also collaborate on creative projects and to have yeah. the leeway to be able to do that is the a great leeway. opportunity. Well, they sure. they would be silly to to not <laughs> allow you to continue in some of these directions. Our land, sure. So this is this is the home page you come to, and you can kind of scroll down. And then we divided the state up into kind of seven different physiographic provinces, um, kind of broad areas of the state. Seven's a good number, right? <laughs> Seven's a good number. So you can see the points for where all the different sites are, mm -hmm. um, and then kind of the art that goes along with each oh, of those provinces. Yeah. Come on, Dan. Look <laughs> at that. Um, so oh. uh, let's go to the Olympic Peninsula. So you click on one of these. You can kind of scroll down, get a nice brief description of the, the province and what you might find there. And then there's this 
nice little map with all these these little um, kind of icons for each site. You click on one, and it takes you to that particular site's web page. Mm -hmm. So the idea behind this is not only to tell tell the geologic story, but also show why you might want to go here as just a, a, a member of the general public. You know, what other things can you do here? So Kalei mm -hmm. Beach 4 is a great spot to see cool geology, um, but it's also a great spot to go tide pulling, walk on the beach. It's in Olympic National Park, mm -hmm. so it's a really beautiful place to, to stop and check things out. So we've got lots of great photos. So this is kind of an angular unconformity here. So these layers are flat here, and then here they're upturned and angled. Um, and actually, I think when we were out there, there was a CWU class out there, I'm pretty <laughs> sure. <laughs> um, one of the mm -hmm. times we went out there <laughs> to date the date the landslide. So here's that bouldery spot you cross over yeah. on the trail. Yeah, wow, look at that. Um, but I got to make this fun. And then here you come fun in. Fun little Come on, this, this is animation. what I'm talking about. So Bring it. 1,300 years ago, there's no landslide. Ah. A big landslide comes down, blocks the creek and it drowns the forest and there's newly created Lena Lake. And then we move to present day. Here's where the trail goes. The landslide's mostly covered in trees. And you can see right here that trail crosses over and you get those big boulders. So kind of tells the story. You know, you might've been going here for years and you didn't know that. Now you see this, you're like, yes. oh, that kind of gives a whole new dimension to, to being there. This is a little bite-sized version of why I think what you do is so powerful. and. I know we just said it, but I'm going to say it again. I would like to be able to grab those four slides, let's say. Oh, yeah. And I and I can advance through when I have Check this my out. class going. Okay. You can go. Well, we're cooking now. This is <laughs> this is one of our Flickr albums. You can download them right here. Each you of those I can download. Yep. I see. Just click I on see. that original size. You get the full oh, size. Oh, good. Oh, I'm going to be busy when I get back. <laughs> I am. Now, I'm, th I'm already realizing that I'm going to have way too many links to post in the description of this interview with you. Do you have one? Like if we go to danco.com uh. or something like <laughs> that, can we get to all this stuff in one place? Or it's not quite not, no, consolidated I don't, that way? I don't, have, I don't think I have all these in one place. I mean, one of the nice things about the f our Flickr page is if you scroll down here, below the images. And I, I can definitely give you a link to our main Washington DNR page, and you'll see all the different albums in there. Okay. But underneath each one, we've got links to all the other versions. So if you go, if you find one of these and you scroll down, there's links to the other four right here. Okay. And then there's other information, like here's the Lena Lake Washington 100 page. Here's information oh, good. about our landslides. So a lot of these, I tried to put as much of those links into each of these pages as possible. Okay, well, I'm just not much of a Flickr person, but I think I need to be for this. So I, that's <laughs> it's it's not perfect, and it's a it can be a little clunky from time mm -hmm. to time. Um, for example, when you go to a page, it gives you. I'll show you. It gives you kind of the big versions of things, which oh I don't my like. God, those are. And you yeah. can click on this little button right there and make them small, so you can see more. So, so like Look you can make this. a little animation with Mount Rainier glaciers there, and you can download all these. And then, yeah, again, if you scroll down, you got links to the other ones. Okay. You can find them, all sorts of info on Mount Rainier and a little description of what the image is. So, thank you for that. So, yes, I'll, I'll put that main, that, that main Flickr page as a link. And then I, I so was so overwhelmed and uh, impressed with your, oh, I can see it bookmarked up there, Danco Carto. Yeah, so that's kind of my my personal website where I've got a lot of the work that I do here as well as some other, you know, work outside of Washington that I've done you, more personal projects just for fun sort of things usually. Can I share that link? Yeah, absolutely. Can we take a peek? Um, sure. It is. Go back to the main page here. Was danco.com taken Dan and you want to? <laughs> <laughs> D-A-N-C-O-E. C-A-R-T-O dot com. There you go. This several, about five years ago. Um, but it's a great way to get a lot of information out there, tell a story about oh, a particular subject. Um, and this, this one in particular is just about how we use bare earth LIDAR data mm -hmm. to um, reveal hazards in geology in Washington. So 
like I was saying earlier, you fly a plane over, shoot a bunch of lasers at the ground, and then you get this three-dimensional, we call it a point cloud. Um, so each of these little dots is a laser point or a laser pulse that hit the ground and bounce back up. And what you can do with that is you can make a kind of a continuous surface. So you see here, these are the points, and then you interpolate the area in between those points and get that. This, is, this would be called the top surface is what mm -hmm. we call it. Um, so trees and buildings are in that one. But then you can strip all that away and just get the bare earth. And this is what we usually are using um, with geology because we like to see what's on the ground. And geologists don't generally like trees very much so because you can't see what's below them. So <laughs> this is a nice way to, to uh, kind of virtually see the ground. And you're familiar with this spot, I'm sure. Well, look at that. <laughs> just there um, the other day wow so these are just some different ways that you can visualize lidar data this is the digital elevation model you can generate contours off of those um, here's the shaded relief or the hill shade and then the aspect which shows what angle the land is pointing to and then a slope map which in this case the flatter an area is the darker it is and the steeper it is the lighter it is in this case so did you do this in part because everybody kept asking how you do it? And you're like, okay, let me um, just send you this instead. It'll save me some time. I, you know, I honestly can't remember <laughs> <laughs> where this originated, but it seemed okay. it seemed like a good yeah. a good way to get this information out yeah. there. Beaver tail bend in living color. Wow. Here again. So with trees, you can't really see much. This is a 10 meter DEM, so kind of older data. And then with that newer LiDAR, you can really start to see that, and then you can delineate it with color. My God. Makes you wonder what you'd be doing if LiDAR didn't exist, you know? Yeah, it's it's definitely changed the game, I think, with geoscience, for sure. Um, here's another great example. Well, that's one of my favorites. Th so yes. this is in the Cedar River watershed. Yeah. Um, and, you know, with the photo, you can't really see much at all, um, landslide-wise. But there are these really interesting kind of... <laughs> That's just, I have I to laugh, it's so cool. <laughs> Called them flow slides. They're just really low profile, but they have really long runouts. Looks like they crossed the river in several spots. But I mean, you can kind of see a little bump right there in the mm -hmm. trees where there might be something. But you know, with the, the bare earth and adding some color to Adding some color, yeah. Really yes. makes it pop out. Yes. And that's one of my favorite things of what you do. The one with the lava flows up by White Pass as well. I, I, or maybe it's not White Pass, but the... This one? Yeah. <laughs> I just started giggling when I saw that for the first time. D do you remember this one in particular? Did you know it would look that way with the LiDAR? Uh, I don't or know. It almost looks like frosting. It does, <laughs> yes. But, I mean, this was fun because there's several distinct, you know, event or, or flows yes. in, in this. So it, it was kind of fun to try to separate them out. And it delineate. doesn't look real. I mean, gosh. But you can, I mean, without LiDAR, you can still see a lot of this, but mm. with it, you can really emphasize the different layers. Well, and it's your lighting position in the shadows. and I think color really helps this yes. one, kind of the gray shade pushing the non-lava to the background. And then faults, this is also another area where it's really been valuable. Um, can kind of well actually I'll just scroll down to this one this is the best example so this is on Bainbridge Island this is the toe jam hill fault scarp and you can see with photo not going to notice much but with lidar you can just see this clear interruption mm. in those those kind of drumlin shapes mm. on the landscape so it's very very valuable in mapping you know uh, surface expressions of, of faults can you think of an example of your work has triggered some research somewhere? I mean, everybody oh has gosh. access to the LIDAR, but you're I making this stuff I don't think pop so. so much. Not yet? I mean, I, I, you know, with, with science, you learn from each other and you learn over time. And so, you know, there yeah. are plenty of people who have come before me that have had all the ideas I think I've had. So I don't, I don't know if that's, that's the case. I not, just see you coming around with this big spotlight, literally, and you're <laughs> going, you know, okay, a bunch of trees. Boom. Have you guys noticed this? How about you go over and check that out? And I, maybe it's a little early because it feels like you... Look at this. Come on, Dan. So this is kind of the tsunami section. I don't um, think I've seen this one. So this is a Cape Disappointment. This is just kind of an example of, of how LIDAR 
can help visualize not only visualize things but we also use it to model tsunamis yeah and potential tsunamis um so you know here's the cape disappointment campground if you've ever been out there mm -hmm. out here on the sand okay. and the town of Iwako. Yeah. um you know a very large cascadia earthquake could inundate this whole area so um, it's a very vivid way of showing that that information and being like okay well, i got to get up this hill fast this is an example of showing it in a very vivid way there we go lidar was not used to create this model um, this is a usgs model that i kind of just overlaid over lidar but but it certainly helps you visualize the fact that you know ording is between the carbon river and the puyallup river which are both part of usgs lahar hazard zones um, it's a good example you're the one that says i think i need this perspective again the overhead maps whatever we've all seen those those maps a million times but you're the guy saying this view tying some th other parts of the story are going to be more effective maybe well I, one of the effective parts about this is you can actually see the housing developments if you look <laughs> really oh closely God. so the scale of it is really shocking yes um, i think and it kind of connects our human scale which is very small to this larger geologic scale hmm. Um, and I think I mentioned earlier with going back to the tsunami um, subject, we have released a bunch of different kind of animations of oh. tsunami data. So this is, I can show you the statewide one just to start with. It gives you a good overview. Okay, of, an ad blocker yeah, for you, man. I know, right? Um, okay, now I'm aware of these. I didn't know this was you, though. You have a hand in this? Well, I have a, I, I, I kind of was at the tail end of the process. Okay. Um, you know, there's a lot of steps before me from the modeling to um, our tsunami team kind of set up this, set this all up in GIS. And then as the last step, I got it to kind of edit it and put it into a video. So, um, well, yeah, I'm the, using the hell out of these. So what, what's your part? You, you, um, same thing we've been talking about, colors and timing. Yeah, and I worked, layout. I worked with Daniel Ungard, who's one of our tsunami scientists to kind of think of colors and design this. Um, and then he actually animated it in GIS using the different frames of data that okay. we have. And then I get that kind of raw video and plop it in here, put um, labels over it, you know, get all the other slides set up to kind of tell the full story. Well, it's beautifully done, especially the one that's a little bit more tied to the San Juan Islands. There's a gasp in the room when I show <laughs> this to the students, yeah. seriously. Yeah. They're like, oh my God, really? So, so yeah, kind of the orangey parts are, are waves that are high and the purple parts are the troughs that are low so it kind of gives you an idea of kind of the, the neutral yellow is sea level and then everything else is above or below that over time and this is sped up you know really fast obviously um, but we've got a lot of other a lot of other videos on our website showing different areas so this is Northern Willapa Bay, for example. God, why didn't I? What did, why didn't I think you were part of this? this? This makes sense now because these are so effective. Please keep going in this direction, Dan. <laughs> Our tsunami team's been doing a lot of great work. Oh my lord! I didn't. I haven't seen this one. Um, but there's there's probably I don't know. There's over a dozen of them on our really? website now, and we're coming out with some. Seattle Fault um, earthquake scenario videos here really? in the next month or so, as well as some some mapping, too. So, we have all that lidar data is is publicly available. We have a a lidar portal. Let's see if I can get to it. So this is our Washington lidar portal. So all this is publicly available data if you know how to use use lidar data and download it. Um, but you can also just zoom in and check things out, which is kind of fun. to do and then we also have tell me if I'm jumping around too much here You're doing great <laughs> this is just this is a, just such a blast we try to get as much information out to the public as we can um, let's see our geologic information portal just has an incredible amount of data in it um, relating to hazards related to geologic mapping relating to earth resources got to make this fun little <laughs> erupting volcano <laughs> <laughs> while, we're, while we're waiting for it to load. <laughs> what haven't you done? <laughs> what do you know about other states? Like, is, is Washington unique in the amount of 
publicly available geology information, let's say? You know, it varies greatly. I mean, st state geological surveys, um, it just depends on funding. Some states don't have any money for surveys. Some have a lot of money for surveys. Mm -hmm. um, if you're in an oil and gas state, you might have more money than you would if you're mm -hmm. not. Um, we're lucky enough to have pretty stable funding here at the moment. So um, yeah, things seem to be going well. And yeah, like right. I said, we're trying to get more information out over time. Well, I um, hope you just you keep turning away here. I hope you don't go someplace else, Dan. You've got so much talent <laughs> that I'm pretty happy, happy where I am. Good. The, I did promise you some new LiDAR images. Good. So. So this is obviously the, the Mount St. Helens one, sans Ooh, okay. text and stuff. We've got a version that doesn't have anything on it. Um, this is a new point cloud image. Hey. The toe of the Bonneville landslide and the bridge of the gods. I, I kind of like this one because this is a very recognizable bridge. Yep. If you're familiar with the gorge. Um, and it really gives you a good sense of scale of how big that landslide really is. Because this is just a tiny little part of it, and you can kind of see the Bonneville Dam in the background there, just starting to poke through. But um, this is that oh, the God. kind of the, the full Drumheller channels photo. Oops, here let's zoom in on that one a little bit. I think this might be some of the areas you've yeah. spent some time. You can find my hammer in, in there somewhere. I think your hammer's up here somewhere. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it is. Yeah, that is that, is that <laughs> island, isn't it? I, I wish I'd known where that was at the time when I was out there. I actually walked up on this this little butte here. It was kind of <laughs> neat. Could have looked for your hammer. Um, well, you know, there was a time I was reading Brett's original stuff from there, and he had good field evidence for multiple floods coming through there with those different, you know. Yeah. So he was kind of almost seeing this before this kind of imagery, which yeah, is pretty amazing. It's hard to imagine. Yeah, yeah. Hard to imagine. I mean, here it's like, well, yeah, it's obvious, but... Right. Back in the day, not so yeah. much. Um, but yeah, lots of great new LIDAR data in Eastern Washington. I think we're hoping to have pretty much the whole state covered in the next few years. So, um, you know, including like North Cascades National Park, we don't have data for right now. Mm -hmm. Getting data there. Um, and a lot of the big holes kind of in the channeled scab lands that, that we don't have data for yet are being filled. So it's very exciting. Um, this is north mm. of the Tri-Cities, Juniper Dunes. Um, uh, wilderness area, kind of the, the north eastern edge of it. It's kind of neat to delineate That's gorgeous, those dunes. yes. And then the Yakima River, oh this is gosh. kind of west of the Tri Cities a bit. Oh. Yeah, you can, whoops, you can really see all the little scroll bars on the, on the oh, landscape. Amazing. Pretty neat. So is it truly like, hey, we got a bunch of new LiDAR. Dan Kid. takes a look and starts <laughs> cruising around and, like and starting getting ideas. Is that kind of? Kid in a candy store. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, look at this. So this is another point cloud. So each of these little tiny points is a laser pulse that hit the ground and, and bounce back up. So these images are really useful in kind of showing how LiDAR works. Um, but if you zoom out far enough, they all kind of blend together and you get a nice image. So this is Horse Thief Butte. Mm -hmm in the Columbia Gorge, kind of across mm -hmm. from the Dalles, Oregon. Um, and this, this area is so neat because you can stand down here by the butte and see all the scoured basalt where the yes. floods rush through. And then you look up on the hills where it's nice and smooth and green rolling hills. And it's just so starkly different. Mm -hmm. Really, really helps to tell, the, tell that story. Um, this is out kind of kind of by near Palouse Falls. I just thought this was really neat. These drainages looked so cool and all the little Little pad of ground mounds out there, um, super, really fascinating. Nothing particularly special about this other than I thought it looked neat. And obviously the ground's not blue, so. <laughs> but it's my favorite color, so. Okay. <laughs> um, this is actually, this might be oh. my favorite new image. This is, um, this is just north of Shelton, Washington, so okay. Hood, Can Hood Canal's kind of up here. Yeah. Um, but this is, this is kind of a spillway or spillover channel from when that Puget Lobe ice was down here. Yes. It was blocking the valleys. Yeah. So, you know, water draining off of the ice or, you know, the glacial lakes. I think this was actually draining off of the ice flowed across here. And there's basically no, there's hardly any, there's not really a river in this section of this anymore. This is all kind of peat bog. 
through here. Um, but not only can you see these channels, you can also see these little depressions here. Or there's some kettle lakes in yes, here. So sir. places places where the big icebergs dropped off of the, the ice sheet and melted created these depressions. And these drumlins out here kind of showing the, the pattern of where the ice or the angle of how the ice moved across the landscape. And then if you zoom in just a little more, you can see all these cool little eskers. They're kind of really? the, the subglacial sediment mounds kind of worming their way across the landscape. It's like a whole glacial geology class in one uh, it's, in one image. It's such a neat spot. And there's actually several of these um, kind of outwash plains. I don't know if I'm using the right term, but yep, yep. Um, there's another one kind of over here and another one over here mm. from that same valley. And it's the Skokomish Valley that these are kind of flowing off of. So really, really cool stuff. Um, and then this is, this is kind of a neat oh. landslide that's out. This is out in the Eastern Columbia Gorge. Um, oh. kind of past, well, Klickitat County, so yeah, yeah. that is. Um, but this isn't really covered up by trees or anything because it's very arid out there. Mm -hmm. It's just a nice way of delineating it. You can yes. actually see it from um, from the highway if you're looking in the right spot. But just made it pop out. You're a popper. You really <laughs> are. And then last but not least, this is, this is the Toodle River, kind of near Mount St. Helens. And the Toodle, when Mount St. Helens erupted, you know, there was a big, big um, debris avalanche that just buried the upper part of the river. Mm -hmm. And then lots of lahars flowed down this drainage and, and others. But these big chunks here are actually part of that part of the mountain that collapsed. And you can see the, the river's just eroding this sediment over time, causing all sorts of problems for the, the, uh, mm -hmm. And the engineers <laughs> who are trying to, to mitigate it. But so those are all the new ones that I'm trying to get these out hopefully in the next few weeks or so. But beautiful. Get those added to our Flickr page. But I've got I've got a long I've l have literal lists of ideas of things and maps that I want to make and, and and you know, we're always getting new LIDAR data, so there's always gonna be, you know, more things to do with that as well. And if you do more video, you're thinking it would be in the animation type stuff, or do you ever visualizing yourself doing some I don't real need, video? You're already doing it. I don't need to do it. No, I. <laughs> you know I'm no. asking. I, you know, well, th there needs to be a, a more professional version of some of what I'm doing. Let's okay. go back here, actually. So we actually have a, a UAV team here at the, the survey, and we've gone out with them several times um, for the Washington 100 project, but they've also gone out recently for debris flows and things like that to get a, a more bird's eye view of things that are hazards that are happening. Are those drones, um, UAV? Drones, yeah, okay. yep. So our drone team, you know, like this is from a few years back at the Mima Mounds just south of here in Olympia. Mm -hmm. One of the neat, neat spots to get up in the air and see the landscape. Um, so we've done, you know, we have plenty of ideas on places where we might go fly um, fly drones to get some some nice imagery of some of the landscape. So we've got we've got a couple trips planned. Hopefully later this summer to a couple of the state parks in the Puget Lowland where we might do some more filming like this. Um, what what if you did some of this drone stuff in a forested area and then we do some sort of wipe away that's so powerful with what you've done and show the LIDAR and the stuff hidden beneath. I think that's just such a cool concept. I, think it'd be, I wonder if there's a way to do that video-wise. I don't know, that's a good question. I mean, there's there's definitely, we don't have this technology yet, but there's there's drone-mounted LIDAR these days. I mean, you have there's LIDAR on your iPhone. You can just go out and, and make 3D scans of things. <laughs> but, but this is actually a good example. You can see these trees over here. There's actually Mima Mounds beneath the trees mm -hmm. in this area, um, which you can see with, with the LIDAR. So yeah, that's an interesting idea. More more intimate scale of things. Yeah. And it goes probably against all of your instincts, but well, look at that. But my instinct is they should know you. They, they 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 should they should know you're the guy behind a lot of this stuff. And that again, maybe that makes you feel uncomfortable, but I, I feel like that could be another part of this. That there's instead of just kind of a bunch of general publications and things, they're, they're somehow identifying it with you and they get to know you a little bit. Whether it's you hosting a YouTube series or you somehow, like I said, you're already doing it, I don't need to be uh, doing that. <laughs> okay, 
Yeah, no, I mean, I, I, I wouldn't be anything without all of my colleagues here. You know, they're such a talented group of people, and um, I didn't do all this filming either. So, you know, I, this, I isn't, hear this you. isn't even me. Um, I hear you. But yeah, it's just, a team. Just but part I, of the team. Okay. <laughs> well, thank you. This has just been a thrill. It really has. It really has just well, been I appreciate a thrill. you coming over the mountain. Yeah.